person only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to another webinar presentation hosted by uh, the Southwest Ontario Regional Base Hospital Program. My name is John Duran. I'm the interim education coordinator here. And today's topics topic will be toxidromes. Um, our two presenters uh, will be Dr. Alex Dong, who is a third year resident, and as always, Dr. Matt Davis, who's the medical director of education and also the local medical director for the London area. Before we get started, um, just wanted to let you know how you can actually ask questions during this uh, webinar. So there's two ways. You can either put your hand up and you'll see a little hand um, picture in your control panel. So if you have a question, put your hand up and what I will do is I will get back to you at the end of the presentation so that uh, we don't stop and go um, throughout the presentation. The other way you can do it is also in your control panel you will see a questions uh, box and you can just simply write in, enter in a question that you have and uh, that will be answered as well. So I think that's all I need to say and uh, we're going to go ahead and start with the uh, presentation now. Thanks John, it's Matt here. I'm uh, here with Alex. Alex is one of our third year residents and has uh, completed his EMS rotation. Uh, for those who don't know, all the, the emergency medicine residents do a month of, of pre-hospital care and EMS, learning about pre-hospital systems here in Ontario. Um, and today as part of Alex's rotation, he's going to be presenting a webinar about toxidromes. So a uh, very interesting topic. Uh, we're seeing you know, more and more illicit street drugs out there and uh, the toxidromes associated with those, but also uh, you know, toxidromes associated with intentional and unintentional uh, overdoses and, and suicide attempts or, or potential uh, uh, unintentional exposures to these, these toxins. So uh, without further ado, here's Alex and uh, he'll get going. All right, thanks. Um, hi, guys. Um, so like mentioned, I'm, I'm Alex, one of the third year emergency medicine residents. Um, so thanks, everyone, for having me here today. Um, I'm going to talk about toxidromes and acute ingestions and exposures. Um, i just trying to advance the slide. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty. All right, so uh, objectives today, so we're um, looking to recognize signs and symptoms of classical toxidromes. So there's four described classical ones, um, sympathomimetics, anticholinergics, cholinergics, and then the sedative hypnotics. Um, we're going to describe sort of the pathophysiology about these toxidromes um, and principles of management in the pre-hospital environment and in the use of, anti of any antidotes um, that are available. Um, so this this man here, this is um, uh, I'm not going to pronounce his name. He has a very long name. Um, he was a Swiss physician um, uh, in the early 1500s, and he's he's known to be the father of toxicology. And he wrote, um, or he, he was the first to really describe um, a dose response uh, relationship between diff between um, chemicals and drugs and uh, their toxic effect uh, on people. Um, and so he coined the, term, the phrase, the dose makes the poison. So there are um, several types of acute poisonings. The mo by far the most common that we see is uh, known as auto-intoxication. So this is when um, the person gives uh, themselves the, 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 um, the toxin. Um, commonly we see them as self-harm, um, so people who are suicidal um, or want to harm themselves for whatever reason. And then obviously we see recreational drug use as well. Um, and then we have a, a category called accidental, so this is like your therapeutic mistakes. So children getting into the, the medicine cabinet or the elderly patient who is confused and takes um, the wrong uh, or an or accidental overdose of their medications. Um, and then other accidental exposures like carbon monoxide um, or if they got sprayed with pesticides uh, on a farm um, and other things like that. Um, you have malicious, so if uh, people are trying to poison someone else. Um, and then Munchausen, so people who, who play the sick role, and that's a psychiatric uh, condition that we're not going to talk about uh, much today. 
Um, so there are some principles um, to toxicology uh, management in the pre-hospital environment. And the, the first thing to talk about is personal protective equipment. So um, like, we, like I mentioned before, the most common um, acute poisoning is the auto-intoxication. And so oftentimes you see recreational drug users. Um, and these people are the people who are high risk for communicable diseases. So first thing is to protect yourself um, from that. Um, but also with people who have acute exposures to a lot of um, things, especially like carbon monoxide or pesticides or caustic chemicals, dangerous chemicals, um, sure, we want to help these people, but we also want to protect ourselves so we don't get exposed to them as well. Um, so personal protective equipment is the first and foremost thing we should do prior to um, actually approaching these, uh, these patients. And then for the most part, management um, is providing supportive therapy. Most, most overdoses, most toxins, our bodies are able to clear on their own, and we just sort of give um, the patients some support by doing that. And we give them some oxygen, give them some IV hydration if they're dehydrated or hypotensive. If they're combative or agitated, we can give them benzodiazepines to settle them, and then to manage their symptoms, whether the medications they took or exposures gave them nausea or pain, and we'll, we'll treat them for that. Um, moving forward, we want to decontaminate them. So people who um, have been exposed to, let's say, like carbon monoxide, we want to remove them from that exposure. People who are sprayed with a chemical, we want to, we, we want to um, irrigate whatever exposed, whatever part of their body was exposed. We want to get them away from that dangerous, toxic environment. Um, a thing that used to, we used to do uh, in general was induce vomiting. The thought was that if you ingested a bunch of poison, um, the best thing to do is to get it out of your stomach. Um, and that had been done for, for many years, and now it's, it's been seen that it's more um, potentially detrimental to the patient. Um, an example being like if someone ingested a very caustic chemical um, and then you induce vomiting, you, what happens is you expose their esophagus and their oropharynx, their mouth to the toxic or to the caustic chemical a second time. Um, otherwise, people who, are, who have ingested a, a poisonous um, medication or toxic dose often are confused, they may be um, altered level of consciousness, and so by inducing vomiting, we can also increase risk of aspiration and then worsening um, the situation. So in general, we no longer uh, recommend inducing vomiting in any intoxicated patient anymore. And not only that, but a lot of the time, by the, the time uh, patients get uh, medical help or paramedics arrive on scene, that toxin has been in the system for quite some time in most cases, so the majority of it is already absorbed. So again, that in addition to the, the two points that Alex just mentioned there, uh, we no longer induce vomiting, so gone are the days of the, the Ipecac syrup. Mm -hmm. All right, and lastly, um, most uh, overdoses, most toxins don't have a true antidote. However, there are a few that do, and so if available, provide the antidote for the for, for whatever overdose that they, that they took. So dextrose, so people are hypoglycemic from an insulin overdose, oxygen for things like carbon monoxide, um, naloxone obviously for opioids, um, and atropine for cholinergic um, overdoses. These are some examples, and we'll talk about uh, a few of these in detail soon. Um, so what a toxidrome is, it's a constellation of clinical signs that suggest a particular type of ingestion. And there's four classical um, uh, toxidromes that have been described. So um, we'll talk a little bit about each of them. We'll, we'll start with we'll start we'll talk about them in this order. So sympathomimetics, anticholinergics, cholinergics, and then sedative hypnotics. Um, and so the first three of these four act on um, uh, the autonomic. Well, they all act on the, the nervous system in some way. But the first three um, act on the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems directly. So. The sympathetic nervous system um, shown on uh, the left here, this is your, your fight or flight response. Um, and so you have uh, nerves that come from your brain um, and then they interact with a more peripheral nerve that then innervates your end organs that, because this can be um, things like your heart to increase your heart rate, um, it can uh, innervate your blood vessels to increase your blood pressure and so on. Um, and so sympathomimetics are chemicals that act um, that generally act here at the end organ to increase their activity, to um, increase or to give you your fight or flight response. The parasympathetic system is pretty much the opposite. This is your rest and digest system. So everything here, it, it decreases your activity, it decreases your heart rate, it relaxes you, it um, increases sort of, uh, sort of gut motility because um, sort of when you're resting, you want that's when, when you're digesting, you're 
spending more of your energy to digest your food and, and whatnot. And so um, the anticholinergics and cholinergics often act on, on this system here. Um, this is a um, sort of a, a breakdown of the, the different toxidromes. Um, here, this, this diagram separates the opioids from the set of hypnotics, but um, in general, they have very similar effects. And so um, for the rest of this presentation, I've, actually, I've combined these two together. Um, and so um, this breaks down basically into the different vital signs and sort of easy ways to identify um, each, uh, each toxidrome. So we're going to start by talking about the sympathomimetics and the anticholinergics in a little detail. These are both um, sort of uppers. They both increase activity. Um, and we'll start with a couple of cases. So that, just to mention that chart, that's a great chart there. One thing to keep in mind, too, is, is oftentimes you don't have the entire history. So you know, very rarely does, do you get the, the entire picture. Um, so oftentimes there's mixed overdoses and the patient may not be forthcoming so you know someone may say this is what I took but they may have taken some other things in addition so you don't always get the the true response so these kind of these kind of responses were would be for just you know a straight out uh, you know somebody who had a gravel overdose would have a anti just with gravel but would have an anticholinergic response or someone who just did uh, you know, like a dilated or oxycontin overdose would, would just have the opioids, but oftentimes there are mixed pictures, so you may get some, some um, unreliable results with this. All right. Um, so our first case, so we have a 38-year-old female from a homeless shelter who was found acting crazy and violent. She's running into traffic. She's agitated, uncooperative, and difficult to restrain. There's empty bottles found in the pocket. Um, her vitals are, are shown, um, so she's slightly... Um, hyperthermic, 37.9, she's tachycardic, she's hypertensive, she's breathing a little fast, um, and her glucose is normal. So she's confused, diaphoretic, has very large pupils, um, and so this, this is a, a patient that we, we, we quite commonly do see, at least here in London. Um, and then our second case, 61-year-old um, male acting bizarre. Um, so the family called 911 after finding him acutely confused, he's hallucinating, he's agitated. Um, he's not oriented to time or place, and also empty pill bottles found around him. Um, vitals are somewhat similar, so he's also a little bit hyperthermic, um, slightly tachycardic as well, not as much as our previous patient, slightly hypertensive, um, and again, glucose was normal. He's also confused, but he's found to be very flushed everywhere, and his pupils are six millimeters. So gets you guys to have those two cases in mind as we talk about um, the, the, next, the two toxidromes. Um, so we'll first talk about sympathomimetics. So these are um, so some examples include amphetamine, so your crystal meth or a methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, um, things like cocaine, uh, phencyclidine, PCP, um, MDMA or ecstasy, um, things like caffeine are, are sympathomimetics, and if you take enough of it, can give you a toxidrome effect as well. Um, and so these are these are some just some common examples, or there's a lot more that are available. But what they do is they, they stimulate your sympathetic nervous system, so your fight or flight response, by activating the adrenergic receptors at the end organ. Um, and they cause agitation, they make you hallucinate, you're delirious. If you give enough of it, you're, you activate enough of these uh, neurons, you, you can induce seizures. Um, and generally, the toxidrome is increased blood pressure, increased heart rate, they're breathing fast, increase in temperature, um, they have dilated pupils, and they're generally diaphoretic. These are um, these are your, quote, crazy, violent um, uh, people. Um, just a little um, note about the temperature. So um, the difference in terminology between hyperthermic and febrile. Um, so generally, for toxic overdoses, we don't like to use the term febrile because that's um, more relating to having a high temperature due to an infection or an inflammatory response, whereas this is truly because you're activating all your muscles, you're generating a lot of heat that way, so they're they're hyperthermic, just a little sort of semantic thing. And that's a great point there, Alex, because yeah, again, when you're thinking of hyperthermia and, and this revved up um, state, uh, agitated, uh, flailing against restraints, against you know uh, police officers, these patients can often go into rhabdomyolysis, which is the breakdown of muscle tissue, which can lead to, to renal failure. Uh, so again, with your your febrile that tends not to occur. So. Great, great point there, the difference between febrile illness and hyperthermia. 
Um, and so the uh, synthetic mnemonics, they can be direct acting or indirect. And so just simply um, looking at the diagram here, your direct acting synthetic mnemonics, they are chemicals that are similar to um, our endogenous ones, or like epinephrine or norepinephrine that our body creates. And so when you ingest these, they act directly on your end organs to cause your effect. You can have indirect acting, which um, can either do two things. They can either affect the nerve and cause the nerve just to excrete a whole lot more of these um, of these of uh, the endogenous uh, catecholamines, or it can inhibit your body's degradation of the available catecholamines that there are that already are there, and so as a net result, cause an increase in activation of our organs. Um, and then, of course, you can have the mixed um, as well. And so, when you see a patient with what looks like a sympathomimetic overdose, um, the management for this is is pretty simple. So it's there's no true there's no antidotes that um, that are available for for most of these. And really, the only thing we do for them is supportive management. So we want to minimize their agitation as much as possible. To it. so have them in a calm environment to minimize stimulation of the for them. Um, and as mentioned earlier, if they're hyperthermic, they're at risk for um, for rhabdo. And so if they're if they're temperature is continuing to rise, they need to be cooled actively, which is different, again, from the febrile illness, um, from inflammatory, where you can give them Tylenol. Giving them an antipyretic like Tylenol or Advil here will actually will not do anything because it's not that they're, they're, um, they don't have that inflammatory response. It's because they're too active and they're just creating too much heat. Um, and so to, to treat their agitation, benzodiazepine is your friend here. Um, and so these uh, the screenshots are from from your medical directive. So midazolam is a great uh, medication for this. It's um, there's multiple routes you can give it, um, and it acts incredibly fast. Um, and so basically, we just want to calm them down so they don't hurt themselves, they don't hurt other people, um, and it decreases their hypothermia because then they're they're not producing as much heat. Um, the next uh, toxidrome is anticholinergic, so it's it's a similar toxidrome. It also increases your activity, um, and we'll talk about how it differs um, in a little bit. So these are some examples. So we have antihistamine, so things like gravol and Benadryl also have anticholinergic effects. Um, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, antipsychotics, anticonvulsants. So there's a, there's a lot of antis that that have um, this effect, um, and then atropine scopolamine are true. Um, Real uh, anticholinergics that only that only act on the cholinergic system, um, and they're not really medications we that patients or people are able to get their hands on. But they're found in a variety of plants um, that are available pretty much everywhere in this climate. So the top bar there, this is um, uh, Atropa belladonna, which is um, the Latin name, but commonly known as deadly nightshade or belladonna plant. Um, they have um, they produce these little black. Um, little black fruiting bodies that uh, kids often can get into um, and these contain a lot of atropine and scopolamine and so they can be quite quite toxic with just a very small ingestion. Um, the picture on the bottom, this is um, uh, commonly known as Jimson weed or devil snare um, and so they, they, they have these fruiting bodies that are, that are sort of the, the spiky little thing that have little black seeds inside. They're very um, popular with a lot of um, uh, kids and like teenagers, um, because if you if you ingest some of these seeds, you get a very good hallucina hallucination um, and you get a really good high from them. And so, but if you ingest a little too many, and then you can become toxic and um, it can be quite dangerous. Um, and so, anticholinergics they inhibit your parasympathetic nervous system. So, if you remember from that diagram from before, um, your sympathetics are um, it ramps you up. It's your fi fl uh, fight or flight. Whereas your anticholinergic or parasympathetic system is your rest and digest. Um, and so instead of the difference being from the sympathetics is that sympathetics increase your activity, whereas um, the parasympathetics um, inhibit your inhibition. So you have your same baseline sympathetic activity still there. We're not increasing it anymore. We're just decreasing your rest and digest system. So you only have a relative increase in your um, in your activity, and so um, there's a there's a there's a saying you can for anticholinergics: you're mad as a hatter, you're red as a beet, you're blind as a bat, you're hot as a hair, and dry as a bone. Um, and so that sort of refers to the symptomatology that these patients get. So they're confused, they're having hallucinations, um, referring to the, the mad hatter in Alice in Wonderland. 
um, red as a beet, so their, their skin is really flushed. Um, they're blind as a bat, so their, their pupils are dilated. They can't accommodate, um, so things are, are blurry. Um, they're hyperthermic, so they're hot as a hair. Um, and then dry as a bone, so the anticholinergic system, the, the parasympathetic system, um, controls um, a lot of sphincter tone. For, so you, they generally are urinary retention, so they're difficult. Um, they're, not, they're not peeing. They, they cause an ileus. Um, and so um, that's where dry as a bone comes from. And again, um, pre-hospital management, uh, again, is supportive management. There's not a, um, there's not a good uh, antidote, especially in the pre-hospital setting for these. Um, and so a calm environment, minimize stimulation, and again, benzodiazepines are your friend here um, because these patients tend to be quite agitated. Um, in hospital, though, we can give uh, physostigmine, which is a um, acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Um, so, uh, and this this is something that that generally is not rare, not commonly given um, because it's usually uncertain exactly how much um, of the the, the um, whatever drug they took, how much they actually took, and so we can also overdose on the physostigmine if we give too much, and then we cause them to have um, the opposite um, as well. So generally, it's um, it's not very commonly given, but it's, it's something that is out there. Yeah, I agree with that, Alice. I, I have not seen that ever given in the hospital. We tend to just to support these patients uh, exactly as you said. You know, just IV fluids and, and sedation as needed, and just let those those toxins wear off. Um, another good point to bring up about this anticholinergic toxicity, and we often see this with ASMAC is, you know, combining Benadryl and Gravol together in patients who may have an allergic reaction who are, who are vomiting. And uh, yeah, exactly the reasons you pointed out there, they both have anticholinergic properties, so you're actually giving them quite a large dose of anticholinergic, and they could get some of these, these side effects from combining those two medications. So, you know, in those, those cases where you've got a patient who's, who's Experiencing an allergic reaction and, and may present, you know, with um, hives and, and stomach pain and vomiting going on. The the best treatment for that type of of, um, of symptomology is treating the allergic reaction or anaphylaxis in this case, given the, the multiple systems involved with exp uh, potential exposure to the the allergen itself. So that's why we don't combine these two medications for this exact reason. All right. So let's go back to the cases we had. Um, so the first one, remember, was a 38-year-old female who was crazy and violent, running into traffic, agitated. Um, so we'll, we'll go to our first poll question. Um, do I advance the slide? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Perfect. So the question is, um, which toxidrome does she have? Is it... Didn't come up? No. Didn't come up. So the, the choices are sympathomimetic or anticholinergic, the two we talked about so far. Okay, so I'm just looking at, uh, so we're going to leave the poll open a little bit longer, maybe a few more, uh, few more seconds. Okay, so we came back, uh, anticholinergics came back at 37% of the attendees and 63% for the sympathomimetics. All right. So you guys know what's coming next. So this is the other case we talked about, the 61-year-old male, um, acting bizarre, um, hallucinating, agitated, not oriented. Um, all right, and so the poll question number two. Okay. Same question. Okay, so we'll give it another 10, 15 seconds here. Yeah. Okay. okay, so this one came back 87% uh, for anticholinergics and 13 for the sympathomimetics. Yes. Yeah. So you guys, um, so the, the majority in both of them were, were correct. So this first one, um, crazy, violent, uh, compared to the, the second stem, this, per, this patient sounds to be more agitated, more 
um, activated in every way. They're more tachycardic, they're more hypertensive. Um, and so this, and they have, they have more dilated pupils or diaphoretic, which is what is the, the, the main difference between the, the sympathomimetic and the anticholinergic. Remember, the anticholinergic, they're, they're dry as a bone, so they shouldn't, they sh their skin should be really, their skin should be dry and not be diaphoretic. Um, the second patient, um, he, he's not violent, he's less um, agitated, he's just more, more confused. Um, and again, his, he's not as tachycardic, he's not as hypertensive, and he's, his skin is flushed, um, and pupils are six millimeters. So this is more of your anticholinergic um, toxidrome. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. With a lot of the anticholinergics, the, the hallucinations, they tend to be visual hallucinations, and they tend to be picking at things that aren't, aren't there and pointing at things. They're, as, as Alex said, you definitely less revved up versus that sympathomimetic when they're, you know, hallucinating, they're angry, they're agitated, like they're, they're taking, you know, multiple police officers to, to get them down um, versus the anticholinergic, as, as you said. It's more of a confusion type of, of hallucination or, or, or confusion. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and so one of the one of the anticholinergics that we talked about was tricyclic antidepressants. So I just wanted to to bring this this one up specifically because of the anticholinerg or yeah of the anticholinergic, this is probably one of the more dangerous ones um, because it's more than just anticholinergic activity. Um, it was initially marketed as an antidepressant um, and now is very commonly used for chronic and neuropathic pain and not so much for antidepressants anymore. Um, commonly, the, the two most common ones are amitriptyline and nortriptyline. There are several others. Um, I just wanted to talk about doxepin a little bit too. Doxepin is actually over the counter and it's marketed as a sleep aid. So it's very easily accessible by patients. Um, and that, that's just sort of the basic, um, the, the core sort of ke chemical structure of uh, tricyclic antidepressants with the uh, three cyclical rings. Um, that brings us to poll question number three. Let me just get that out. There we go. And so I think the question is, what makes uh, TC overdoses uh, more dangerous than other anticholinergics? And so you have uh, five choices there. So we'll wait another 10 seconds. It's a very tough question. Okay, so let's close the poll. And so uh, A came in at 9%, B, um, that's the most, 61%. Uh, nobody for C, 9% for D, and 22% for E. All right, so again, the majority have it. Um, so tricyclic antidepressants, they, they have activity at a, at a lot of places. So they, these are just, these are not, this is not an exhaustive list of where they, they act. This is just sort of um, some of the, where they have the most activity in. Um, so they're anticholinergic, they're antihistaminergic. They have a sodium channel blockade, calcium channels. Um, they inhibit the reuptake of serotonin and or epinephrine. They're um, alpha adrenergic and they um, antagonize your NDMA receptor. So what's most important here is your sodium channel blockade. Um, and the reason for that is when you block sodium channels, um, you slow membrane depolarization, especially in the heart, and it makes you very prone to having arrhythmias. Um, so when you de when you slow depolarization of your cardiac myocyte, you what what happens is you slow the the ECG intervals. You slow your PR, you slow your QT, and, mo and you slow your QRS. Um, and so what happens is your QRS actually prolongs. Um, and so here you can see you can measure if you measure that it's almost the one whole big box, which is 200 milliseconds. Um, and so we, like a normal QRS should be less than 120. Um, and so part of your pre-hospital management here is if, if you're considering TCA overdose or tricyclic antidepressants, then an ECG is something that should be done to, to see if there is um, any arrhythmias that happen. Because as your QRS continues to lengthen, as your QT continues to lengthen, um, this patient becomes very high risk for, um, for ventricular arrhythmias um, to develop. Um, and so I circled this one QRS in the AVR lead, um, and this is something a little bit more advanced, but it's a hallmark of a sodium channel blockade. We see a very tall R wave um, in the AVR lead, and that's one of the um, only times that the AVR lead is, is useful in an ECG.
Um, and so aside from the ECG, the rest of your pre-hospital management, again, is going to be a lot of supportive management, just like the other um, anticholinergics. Um, the one difference is here you want the patient to have some continuous cardiac monitoring because they're, they're high risk for arrhythmias. Um, and this one has a um, has somewhat of an antidote. So sodium bicarbonate is um, given, uh, is it indicated for a tricyclic antidepressant overdose. Um, and there are several purported mechanisms of how it works. And so when you block all the sodium channels, um, if you give the patient a whole lot of sodium, you can overcome some of that blockade. And so one of the mechanisms is that you flood the receptors with extra sodium. Um, and this can um, um, this can uh, alter what, what the TCAs have done and then shorten your QRS significantly. Um, also, it can alkalize your plasma, so make your plasma pH um, a little bit more elevated. And so with an elevated pH, less of the TCA is actually metabolically active, um, and so you get less of, a, of an effect that way. Um, I think in a previous webinar, we talked about um, given bicarb, um, and so I won't go into too much detail about it, but there is a, um, consensus, a consensus guideline for out of hospital management. Um, so unfortunately, there's currently no good studies dem demonstrating the eff effectiveness um, of giving bicarb in a pre-hospital setting, um, and there's no um, studies looking at um, any harms that, that can come from it. So the consensus was that it may be beneficial if you have it, um, but it's something that you would have to, to patch for anyway. Um, and so the the recommended uh, dose for a TC overdose is one to two millicouplins per kilogram. Um, and so um, I think in the trucks you probably only have one to three amps of bicarb. Um, and so um, don't be surprised if when you patch, the physician asks for no bicarb to to a whole bunch of bicarb more than you have because there is um, not great consensus on using this antidote in the uh, pre-hospital setting. So obviously bring up another great point. So yeah, in this case, you know, you have a patient who has a, a confirmed TCA overdose who does present uh, as a TCA or toxidrome going on there who's uh, tachycardic, has a wide QRS complex. Uh, for the ACPs out there that, that can use the sodium bicarb, I think this would be an excellent time to, to patch the physician for some shared decision making. Uh, for giving the, the sodium bicarb in these patients. Um, as the QRS, the, the longer the QRS becomes, the more at risk they are for uh, both seizures and cardiac arrhythmias. So this could potentially be a, a valuable life-saving treatment in those severe overdoses. All right. Um, so let's move on to the next uh, toxic problem. So cholinergics, um, there's very few true medications that people can overdose on that are truly cholinergic. Um, much of, most of these are um, more exposures. So organophosphates and carbamates are pesticides very commonly used in agriculture. Um, and so they're sprayed on crops to, to, to protect them from, from different pests. However, these uh, chemicals are very strongly cholinergic. Um, you can also find cholinergic compounds in certain mushrooms. Um, so these are fiber cap mushrooms shown in the picture. And they are found everywhere in the world in the temperate climate that we live in. So um, kids who get into the, in their lawn, whatever, find some mushrooms. Um, can be toxic with, with that. And then um, warfare gases, so especially sarin gas, was a, it is a um, very strong cholinergic as well. Um, and so they activate your acetylcholine receptors, um, or they can inhibit the enzyme that degrades your, your endogenous acetylcholine, and it just results in cholinergic activity throughout your body. Um, and so the mnemonic um, to describe uh, the um, the, the symptoms you get from, from a culinary toxidrome is sludge. So salivation, these people are drooling, they're, they're black mates, they're crying, they're um, uncontrollably urinating, I guess. They have diarrhea, um, they're, they're nauseous, they're, they're vomiting. Um, so basically... Sounds like a, a nasty gastro virus yeah. that uh, is going on there. <laughs> We've all been there before. It sounds like there, there's, there's some sort of liquid coming out of every orifice. Um, however, people don't... People don't salivate to death. People don't lacrimate to death. So what, what kills people from a cholinergic overdose uh, or exposure are the killer bees. So not only do you get fluid coming from, from your, like your GI tract, you also have fluid coming from your respiratory tract. So they get bronchorrhea as well. So their lungs and their, their um, airways fill with, with mucus and fluid. 
they get bronchospasm, so um, their, their airways get smaller, and while they're filled with fluid, it makes things worse. And of course, they also get bradycardia. So these three things together are what makes cholinergic so, uh, overdoses so deadly. And I think, th and this, um, from a pre-hospital management point of view, is where your personal protective equipment is most, is most important. Um, because these are most commonly um, chemical exposures, people were sprayed with pesticides um, or other chemicals, and so when you go and help these patients um, who are not, um, when you don't have protective equipment on or who are not appropriately de decontaminated, um, you, you yourself become exposed to it um, and then you get the symptoms as well. Um, and so decontamination, remove all possible contaminated clothing from the patient and lots and lots of irrigation. So shower these patients, um, preferably before transport if possible, but um, and when uh, when you do patch through um, that you bring a uh, cholinergic um, toxic patient, um, generally these patients will be showered and, and uh, um, uh, decontaminated prior to them actually entering the hospital and receiving their treatment. Um, and then again, uh, supportive management. So these people can lose a lot of fluid very, very quickly. And so IV hydration um, for dehydrated patients and hypotensive patients, um, oxygen and ventilation support um, very commonly will be needed because of the, the, the um, bronchorrhea and bronchospasm that they do have. Um, and then for cholinergic, there is a, um, there's a true antidote for, for this um, toxidrome. Um, and so the picture there is the Mark II auto-injector. It was um, something that was given to soldiers in, uh, in the Second World War when um, sarin gas and other toxic gases were, were commonly used. And so it's two um, injectors, IM injectors, um, sort of like the EpiPen. One contains atropine, one contains pralidoxine. Um, so atropine is the opposite, um, has the opposite effect of uh, cholinergic. Atropine is a true anticholinergic. Um, and so basically the, uh, you start with two milligrams IM, um, and then every five minutes you give another dose, either IM, IV, until your killer bees are controlled. Um, and this can very quickly deplete your supplies of atropine. Because um, the ACLS dose for atropine is like um, 0.5 milligrams per dose, and so you're giving two at a time every five minutes. So you don't have that much atropine before you run out of it. Um, the pralidoxime or um, um is a chemical that reactivates the cholinesterases um, in your body. Um, and so when these, um, when these compounds, when you get exposed to these compounds, these compounds are highly, they have a lot of phosphorus in them. And the phosphorus inhibits um, your body's uh, enzymes to be able to degrade um, um, the natural acetylcholine in your body. And so this chemical reactivates those enzymes, which then can help your body itself clear the, talk, the, 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 um, the symptoms that you're getting as well. Um, this is a screenshot from the, um, uh, the auxiliary directives that you guys have in Appendix 5. Um, and so um, I learned today that not that most, uh, most, um, most people services don't, yeah, have, don't have these auxiliary directives. Yeah. I believe only the, the uh, Windsor Essex paramedics, mm -hmm. the ACPs down there, use this, this directive. Uh, so it's just uh, kind of directed towards our, our medics down there, but this is, this is exactly the, the directive that is standing. Yeah, so you can have mild, moderate, or severe um, exposure. So for the mild, it's just um, supportive management alone. And then for moderate or severe, um, that's when you actually give the atropine and the pralidoxime to the patients in um, increasing um, uh, doses. Um, and so here, this is a case study from 1986. So it's an old case study, but it illustrates how much atropine someone may need um, to, to combat the, this toxidrome. So this 68-year-old gentleman drank three ounces of pesticide, so like 90 mils, um, so not a whole lot, but in the first 24 hours received 3,600 milligrams of atropine. Um, so remember that ACLS dose is 0.5, right? So that's, a, that's initially already a, a huge dose of atropine. And through his entire 35-day hospital stay, he had th over almost 31,000 milligrams of total atropine. Um, and so you can see how quickly you can deplete your atropine, but you also these patients, if you have one or two of them come to your hospital, um, you can deplete the entire hospital supply of atropine very, very quickly. Um, there's been also case studies to, to say that once a hospital has run out of atropine, they've taken like atropine eye drops from like ophthalmology 
departments, whatever, and started giving that to patients because there is some atropine in there to help um, with uh, with um, the situation. And kind of the mantra within the emergency department is if we do get heads up that a, a severely um, toxic patient is coming in from a, a cholinergic toxicity, we start calling around immediately to all the other floors to start getting the atropine because exactly as Alex said, you know, with these severe these severe exposures, you start eating up all the supplies of atropine very, very quickly. There was an interesting study that was done about a decade ago um, looking at using jimson weed as a protective agent in severe organophosphate toxicity. Um, and so like we talked about before, jimson weed is um, highly anticholinergic, so it would make sense that if you, if you gave this to patients who are cholinergic toxic, it would help. So this was, a, this was an animal study. This was looking at rats. Um, because it's not really ethical to give jimson weed to people when they come in cholinergic toxic, so they can only do this on animals. Um, and they had great success. So um, nine out of the ten animals who didn't get the jimson weed died from their cholinergic toxicity, whereas only one of the ten died when they, when they got jimson weed. So it makes sense that it works because jimson weed just contains a lot of atropine and scopolamine. Um, so I guess if you really run out of... Um, run a vatropine in your hospital, um, you can go outside in the bushes, look, look for some ginseng weed and feed it to your patients, I guess. And perhaps it will be uh, an offshoot of the uh, medical marijuana industry one day. We'll have the <laughs> ginseng weed uh, industry going. Yeah. All right. Um, and so the last um, talk to talk about is your sedative hypnotics. So these are, um, it's a group of, um, it's, it's an overall like umbrella term to, to talk about all of the chemicals that are um, that can sedate you, basically. So these, are, these are the downers as opposed to the uppers. Yeah, so your benzodiazepines, so whether you're prescription benzos or you're not so prescription benzos. So uh, rohypnol um, is the is uh, commonly known as a roofies or date rape drug. Um, your opioids and opiates. Um, so a little terminology again. So opioids are all chemicals that, have, that act on the opioid receptor, whereas opiates are um, naturally occurring um, opioids that are found in the opium poppy plant. Um, and then also alcohols, barbiturates, uh, and GHB, chloral hydrate. Um, so these four um, pictures here, this one here, this is your, your generic chemical structure of a benzodiazepine. Um, so the R's here represent sort of a um, different um, uh, hydrocarbon chain um, that uh, determines which benzodiazepine it is. Um, here we see a bunch of fentanyl patches that people can either um, just apply to themselves too much or, or, or ingest or smoke or whatever they do with it. Um, some heroin, and this is um, windshield washer fluid, which is uh, one of your toxic alcohols. Um, and so what they do, um, they decrease your sym uh, sympathetic nervous system activity, but they do, do so through a different mechanism. Um, they cause decreased respiratory rate, especially with the opioids. Um, they decrease your heart rate, decrease your blood pressure, they can decrease your temperature. Um, not a whole lot, but theoretically it could. Um, they cause a lot of sedation. It causes meiosis, um, so pupils are, are tiny, um, and it causes people to be confused and delirious often. Um, and how they work, so there's, so if we look at the non-opioids, um, they're mostly GABAergic. So they work on your, um, your GABA channels in, in your neurons. Um, and so GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And so when a GABA channel or a GABA receptor is activated, it stops that cell from working, it stops that neuron from firing. And it does so by being, it, the GABA channel itself is a chloride channel, so when it opens, the cell gets an influx of chloride ions, the cell becomes hyperpolarized, and then it no longer can fire its action potential. And so this is the common um, mechanism for, for benzodiazepines, for alcohols, for barbiturates, for, for most of these, um, these downer, these downer um, toxins. Um, the other one is, is your opioid receptors. This is your, your opioids and opiates. There are several opioid receptors that we have in our body, so there's five, um, but really only two of them, the kappa and the mu receptors, are associated with the, the toxidrome that we do see. And so they're, the kappa and the mu, they're associated with the meiosis, the pinpoint pupils, the analgesia, and the sedation. And the mu receptor especially is what gives you um, the euphoria response with it. It, make, it gives you the high, and with it, it gives you the dependence um, to, to opioids, um, and also is responsible for the respiratory depression. And through a much more complicated mechanism through second messengering um, systems inside the cell, it ca also causes 
um, a decrease in activity and decrease in downstream neurotransmitter release from, um, from those neurons. Um, and so talking about the management again, um, common theme is supportive management. So these patients, if they're not breathing so well, give them oxygen and ventilation support. If they're hypotensive, you can give them IV hydration um, to help that. Um, the antidote, um, so naloxone is specific to, to the opioids. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, there is an antidote for your benzodiazepines, but it's not something that's um, used um, in the pre-hospital environment. It's not something that's generally used in the hospital either. Um, because benzodiazepines, if you um, give this antidote, um, you can very often precipitate seizures that you can't stop. And so um, it's not something that is routinely given unless um, it's a, a, a physician or provider overdose acts, the patient accidentally with the benzodiazepine and knows exactly how much they give them, um, and then they know exactly how much how uh, to, to reverse it. Um, and so we'll talk about another case. So there is a 75-year-old female um, from home. Uh, mild dementia has back pain, so decided to take some Tylenol. However, she grabbed the wrong bottle and accidentally took four of her, her son's 2 milligram hydromorphone tabs instead. Um, decreased LOC, difficult to rouse, GCS is 7, um, and those are her vitals there. Note that the rest rate is 5, and she's a little bit hypoxic at 89% on room air. Um, and so with that, we'll go to our next poll question. So what dose of IV naloxone would be most appropriate for this patient to maintain adequate ventilation. So I know that this would be um, a patch anyway, like you, get, you would have to patch to give the naloxone, but um, just answer what, what you think would be most appropriate. So again, we'll give it a few more seconds here. Okay, so the answers came in, 83% went with A, 7% with B, 0 for C, and 10% for D. All right, okay, so then we'll talk about another case. Um, here we have a 25-year-old female found unconscious in a hotel bathroom by hotel staff. There's obvious track marks on um, arms and legs and empty hydromorphone pill bottle on the counter, pupils are pinpoint, again GCS7. Um, respirate is four. Um, and again, we have the same question. What dose of IV naloxone is most appropriate? This just came up from the last one. So it's pretty, it's exactly the same question as before. Um, so if you can just look at it, I can't launch a separate uh, question. I That's brought okay. up the old one. So um, just work with the same numbers as sure. before. Okay. Um, so there's no real right or wrong answer here. It's sort of a decision you guys make uh, together with the, the patch physician. Um, this is the, um, the, uh, the screenshot from um, your medical directives about naloxone. So there's multiple ways of giving it. However, what I'm, the point of these two questions was to consider using lower doses for chronic opioid users. Um, so there was um, a study recently that, that came out um, looking at using very low dose naloxone, like as low as 0 0.04, so um, a tenth of the the IV dose that is that is written in your um, in your directives, and so the idea is that for opi for non opioid naive um, people, so people who are chronic users, um, they if you give them a whole whack of naloxone, if you block out all their opioid receptors, you can precipitate them to go into withdrawal quite quickly um, with your one time dose. And often you see these, um, these IV drug users who are overdosed on their opioids, you give them a bunch of naloxone, they wake up very angry because you ruined their high. Um, they can become violent, they can become agitated. Now they're difficult to, to control. Um, and they're, they're trying to refuse care, they're trying to run away. And the problem is if they, if they do get away, um, the naloxone often has a shorter half-life than some of the um, opioids that they're using. So they get away from you or, um, and then the, the naloxone wears off, um, they're back into their, their opioid overdose, they, they fall, they, they're not breathing again, and then they can, they can die um, from their overdose, even though um, they did get the one dose of naloxone. The idea of the 0 
um, or the, the low dose naloxone is for for these patients who have this chronic um, opioid use to give them just enough naloxone to keep them breathing to bring back their respiratory drive but not necessarily wake them up completely so they're still sedated they're still calm maybe even still unconscious but at least they're breathing so that you can you have a nice transport to hospital um, you can let them ride out their um, they're high with their, their opioids and they're nice and non-combative um, and let their body sort of metabolize all their opioids on their own and just give them the minimum naloxone necessary to, to make sure that they, they don't die from, from hypoxia. And so the first case we talked about was the, the opioid naive elder, elderly patient who accidentally took an overdose. That's the patient who you, would, you wouldn't hesitate to give a bigger dose of naloxone to because they never intended to get high. They, it, was a, it was a therapeutic um, accident. Um, and so if you re reverse um, completely, they wake up, they go back to normal, um, and they thank you for helping them. Whereas the, the um, chronic opioid user, the, the recreational drug user, will be mad at you for, for getting rid of their high and may become violent. So it's, it's something that, that's uh, coming out that's new, that's, um, that uh, isn't, there isn't a whole lot of literature on, but it's, it's something to consider. So, um, and a lot of physicians in the hospital even even give the the low dose once they arrived in hospital. So, um, don't be surprised if um, on your patch um, you're only given a very low dose of naloxone to give um, to some of these patients. Yeah, you, you struck a very important point there. The the whole purpose of naloxone again is not to wake them up, but just to to keep the patient breathing. That's the the main reason why why we give it and that's what we're going to do in the emergency department for the exact the exact reasons you highlighted there. Yeah. Alex. Perfect. Um, and so that uh, here is um, this is just a, a flow chart I found in uh, on, on a Google search um, and so you have your toxidromes or whatever symptoms you have. So if you first look at their pupil size, if they're pinpoint, um, you, go, you go down this pathway and they're either cholinergic or they're, they're opioids depending on their bowel sounds. Remember a cholinergic um, overdose, you're, you're leaking from every orifice, so you should have um, a lot of bowel sounds, so they're hyperactive. Or if they're hypoactive with opioids, the opioids can give you an ileus with it. Um, if their pupils were uh, normal dilated, then you can look at their temperature. If they're um, hyperthermic, they're super active, they're either a sympathomimetic or an anticholinergic, looking at their bowel sounds as well. Good luck li listening to bowel sounds on a sympathomimetic overdose. <laughs> Yeah, and then um, th this one talks about hallucin uh, hallucinogenics instead of hypnotics as well, which we didn't talk about um, today. And, um, but yeah, any any questions anybody has? Well, that was great. Thanks, thanks, Alex. Um, Alex, it's a great a great topic, very interesting topic. Um, you know, a lot of pathophysiology in there, so we see a lot of pharmacology and pathophysiology with these these patients here, but. And you did a great job there of, of summarizing everything relating it to the pre-hospital setting. So if there are any questions, we're happy to answer them. And if not, we thank everyone for, for joining us today. And we hope that this was, was beneficial for you. Okay, so we'll leave. Um, we'll stay open for the next minute or so. If you have any questions, either put your hand up. And, uh, and I will ask you to ask your question if you have voice capability. Or if you just want to simply send us um, a question, actually write it and send it in the question box, uh, we can address that there. Um, so we'll leave it open for the next minute or so, and then after that we are done. And in the meantime, I just want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. I'd like to uh, um, thank Dr. Dong and Dr. Davis for um, presenting this uh, very, very um, interesting topic. And um, thank um, everyone for being here today. So we'll just wait a few more seconds and we'll shut it all down. Okay, so it looks like we have some questions coming in. Uh, so I'm going to let Dr. Davis sure, so handle these ones. The first question coming in, are we likely to see hyperkalemia in a cholinergic overdose? Hyperkalemia in a cholinergic overdose. 
So to, to answer your question, very unlikely to see hyperkalemia in a cholinergic overdose. Um, I mean, the, 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 the focus on these patients, again, the biggest thing is going to be decontaminating them, getting them uh, the exposure, um, you know, if it's a, 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 a dermal exposure, protecting yourself, and then getting the patient decontaminated, and then focusing on, you know, if there's severe exposures, again, focusing on ventilatory support and airway management. So unlikely to see hyperkalemia in the acute phase of, of a cholinergic overdose. And then the, the second question coming in, would low dose, a low dose of Narcan be a single dosage or repeat, repeated every few minutes? So you, so the low dosage is it, you're titrating to effect, right? So you're starting with a low dose. If that low dose is not working for you, then you can you slowly increase your, your dosages until you get the desired effect that you want, which is um, not necessarily to wake them up, but to keep them breathing. So again, yeah, I mean, this would be something to discuss with, with the patch physician. Again, if, if this is something you think would be beneficial to your patient, I mean, you know, we rely on your clinical judgment too. So, you know, as, as patch physicians, we're always wanting to know the, the orders that you are, are requesting. And then again, making a, a decision together based on the circumstances with that patient. So, you know, if this is a patient who's a, a chronic overdose or a chronic user of, of uh, opioids or opiates, and uh, you, you want to, you need to give some Narcan, then by all means that would be something you, you can request. Um, and oftentimes, you know, uh, I had hoped that patch physicians would leave a, a standing order for you as well. You know, you may give a second dose of X amount if the first dose is ineffective. And we've got another question here. So seeing as our first dose of, ch first dose of choice is sub-Q, what would a low sub-Q dose be? And so as, the, as you're all aware, the directives are kind of in preferential order from, from left to right. And again, uh, from a mandate, from a, a base hospital standpoint, we're going to leave the decision as to, to which route you want to use based on, on your clinical judgment and, and the patient before you. Sometimes sub-Q will be most appropriate route, sometimes IV, sometimes intranasal. It, it all depends. So um, did you come across anything in the, in the the subcutaneous dosage based on, on your review there of the literature? So there, there's very few things in the literature about this low dose um, naloxone usage. Um, so far I've only found IV use and it's literature only comes from actually in hospital use of this low dose naloxone but the the concept has been been around for a while um, and so um, there I have I was not able to find any um, sort of dosages for, for the sub-Q route mm -hmm. um, but if um, like pharmacologically speaking, it would be higher than the IV dose. Um, and on your directive, it's, it's double the IV dose. So um, it's something to, to talk about with uh, the patch physician, I guess, to, to make a collective decision on that. And the, the thought too being that the subcutaneous route is going to be a bit more gentle of an awakening just because the the, uh, the peak effect is going to be a bit later than IV. IV is going to have a you know very quick onset. So if you kind of come across a patient and give them a, a very large dose of IV Narcan, they're going to wake up a lot sooner than if through the, the subcutaneous route. I mean, it's not a huge amount of difference between the two routes, but definitely subcutaneous is going to be a bit a bit more gently, gentler waking up. But as, as Alex said, you know, when it comes to the, the world of toxicology, the, the research out there is not not the best, A, because we don't see a lot of, of patients who we can get into randomized control studies for this type of, of um, issue. Um, and that being said, a lot of the, the research is just based on, on case series, um, as, as uh, Alex here highlighted. So no research out there about the sub-Q dosages in terms of lower doses at this point. Okay, and I think that's it. I don't see any more questions. I don't see any hands up. So thank you for being here and stay tuned for more webinars. We have a few topics in the works for June and uh, we will communicate that in the flyer when they are ready to go. Uh, have a great afternoon.